I'm Dr. Anna Seddon, I'm from the University of Bristol, the School of Physics. And the interests of my group are really in understanding soft matter structures using scattering. And what I want to talk to you today about, and I'm just going to start sharing my screen now, is uh, some work that I've been doing in collaboration. And one of the things I like very much about doing scattering is the chance to collaborate with people who make fantastic materials. And the group that I've been working with are really um, experts in making uh, new and interesting functional gel structures. And so what I'm going to talk to you about is one specific story um, about how we use scattering techniques to try and understand what these gel structures look like. But more importantly, to try and think about what understanding the structures look like leads us to then be able to think about how we might design new materials. Now, I want to start with a few thank yous because this work was very much not just me who did it. In fact, it was the brainchild of Professor Dave Adams and Dr. Emily Draper at the University of Glasgow. And along with uh, fantastic postdocs, uh, Dr. Bath Dietrich and Dr. Kate McCauley, um, really, uh, I came in fairly late into this project uh, when it came to looking at how we could use scattering. Um, I also want to uh, sort of say thank you to my student, Chris Brasnett, who's in his final year of his PhD. He'll be looking for a postdoc next year if anyone's interested. And uh, he's been absolutely invaluable in collecting data and making sure that we uh, had all the samples run. Uh, also, Professor Rob Richardson, who's been great at providing some bespoke software, and also all of the beamlines, the various beamlines that we've been able to work at, and the EPSRC for giving us some money to do this. So, the story I want to tell you today is uh, about gels. And I think it's worthwhile starting by describing what a gel is, um, and then going into something more specific about the types of gels that I want to talk about. So. A gel in its simplest form can be de uh, described as a dilute cross-linked system, which is mostly liquid, but it has the behaviour of a solid. And it's this cross-linked network within the liquid that holds the liquid together to make the gel that's really, really structurally important. And that's the thing that we're going to be looking at today is what does that network look like and how does understanding the structure of the network allow us to understand more about material design? Now, the nice things about gels is you can make them from pretty much anything you want. So things like colloids can make gels, proteins can make gels, uh, small molecules, as we're going to talk about more later, can make gels, and also polymers can make gels. Um, so we've got a huge potential chemical space that we can explore. And one of the reasons that it's really important to understand these is they actually have huge commercial value. So uh, the food industry uses gels, the self-care and pharmaceutical industry use gels. It's a very rare day, actually, that you will not use a gel in some kind of product. But what's more interesting, I think, from the sort of pure scientific point of view is the fact that because we have a vast chemical space that we can explore, we can potentially have tunable functionality within that gel. So we can actually tune the building blocks of the gel and build them in such a way that maybe we could use them as catalysts or maybe we could use them in functional electronic devices. And so it's not just about shampoos and, and, and foodstuffs, it's actually something much more exciting. The specific type of gel that I want to focus on today is these low molecular weight gelators. So the gelator molecule is the one that's going to come together to form the gel. And these ones are based around dipeptides. Now, the chemistry of this is something that if you want to go into any more detail about, I suggest that you contact Professor Dave Adams um, about this, uh, because this is very much his area of expertise. This is what his group have been doing for a very long time. Um, but very simply, to give you an idea of the kind of systems that we're going to talk about, I'm going to show you this uh, molecule here, which we're going to call TUNAPFF. And the interesting thing about TUNAPFF is we have two amino acids at one end and we have a naphthalene group at the other. And what happens is if we take a solution of TUNAPFF at high pH, so pH 11 or so, um, we'll get a structure formed in solution. But if we reduce that pH or we put a lot of salt into that system, those structures will come together and they'll form a gel. And so this is a low molecular weight because it's a small molecule. It's a low molecular weight gelator. Now, looking at that molecule, those of you with a more kind of chemical uh, sort of uh, bent to your research might see that actually there's quite a lot that you can do with that. So there's plenty of things you might be able to tune, you might be able to play with, and you might be able to try and uh, vary to get different properties. It's not always as straightforward as it, as it might seem, and we'll look at why that might be later on. So this is the kind of basic system that I want to talk about today. But why? 
Scattering turns out to be really valuable when working with low molecular weight gelators. And the reason for this comes from when we think about other ways that we might want to measure or look at the properties of a gel. So if we want bulk mechanical properties, we can always turn to rheology. There's quite a lot of rheological data that's going to go along with what I'm going to show today, but I'm not going to discuss it in any detail. And I can point you to the publications if you want to see it. Um, but I want to focus very much on structure today. So what about the structure? How are we going to measure the structure? So the first thing you might want to do is take an image and we could do electron microscopy. But the problem with electron microscopy is we're working with something here that is almost entirely liquid. So if we have to remove the liquid in order to look at the structure, it isn't a representation of what the structure looks like. We can do cryo-electron microscopy and freeze the liquid, but that's incredibly hard to do with viscous samples and very often the structure breaks up during sample preparation. The other problem with electron microscopy is we're looking down on a two-dimensional structure here. So these things are 3D networks. An electron microscopy tells us nothing about things like the cross-section. And so what we have here is something that doesn't really show us the whole picture. And it can be quite misleading to just rely on the microscopy. So we could turn to a technique such as atomic force microscopy, which is better. We can work in a liquid. But again, we're still really only skimming the surface of the material and we're not probing what's happening to the network structure. So this gives us an opportunity to turn to my technique of choice, which is small angle X-ray and neutron scattering. And the reason that these are really good for looking at gel structures is because we get a fuller picture in three dimensions, but also we have a time resolution we can play with. So not only can we look at the solution at the beginning and the gel at the end, but if we're careful, we can actually look at the transition from one to another. So we get a really full picture, not only of the structure, but of the structural transition, and that's really important. But no technique is perfect, and we do need to consider the length of these objects. So we might have lengths that are outside of the scattering range of the instrument, so things that are really long. We do, particularly with X-ray scattering, have to consider the fact that these are low molecular weight systems in water, and so our contrast might not be very good, uh, but we'll talk about how we get over that in a minute. And also, these are soft materials, they're not perfect, and they may have a degree of polydispersity, which makes uh, any subsequent data fitting that we do a little bit more challenging. But the story I'll tell you today uh, I think kind of exemplifies what you can do with scattering if you take into consideration the way you design the experiment. So what we're going to do is use selective deuteration to look at TUNAP FF and understand its solution to gel transition. So we're going to start in the solution state and we're going to gel the system in situ and look at what happens. So I've put up the structure here of TUNAP FF and in red what I've done is I've highlighted the bits where we're going to swap hydrogen for deuterium. So different parts of the molecule are going to have the hydrogens replaced with deuterium. If we run these samples in D2O instead of H2O in a neutron scattering experiment, what we effectively do is we contrast those bits out. So we effectively render them invisible. They're still there obviously, but the neutrons are not going to be able to probe that part of the structure. By running all of these, what we can do is we can build up a picture of how each part of the molecule is involved in the overall structure that we form. And we can try and then understand how the structure changes as it moves from a solution to a gel. So we're going to be running each of these different molecules self-assembled in solution, turn them into a gel and look at what the neutron scattering data tells us. So the experiment looks a bit like this in its very, very cartoon form. We're going to take 2-NAP FF at high pH in solution, and that might be the deuterated or the undeuterated form. And we're going to look at the kind of cylinders that it forms in solution. We know from previous data that it forms cylinders. Then what we're going to do is we're going to add this molecule called gluconodeltalactone. And what this does is it lowers the pH really slowly over a period of a couple of hours or so. And it does this because it hydrolyzes to give gluconic acid. And what this allows us to do is gel the whole system rather than giving it a quick squirt of, for example, uh, sulfuric acid, where it would just gel where it touched. And so here we can get a homogeneous gel. We get much better scattering data. And then finally, after it's gelled, we're going to look at the structure of the gel. We're going to ask three main questions. What's the solution state structure of the two NAPFS cylinders? How does the gel form? And what is the final gel state structure of the cylinders? Are they the same cylinders we started with or have they changed their structure during the gelation process? So 
To show you the type of data we get, I'm going to start with some not neutron scattering data. I'm going to show you some X-ray scattering data. So what you can see here, and I can just get a laser pointer up for you. Uh, there we go. Here you can see some X-ray scattering data. And the important thing to know is we're looking at an undeuterated and two deuterated uh, X-ray scattering patterns here, and they're all pretty similar. And if you fit them, they all fit to a flexible cylinder. It's really important to check that the deuteration process doesn't affect the samples and that you actually get the same results because running these things in D2O, running these things with deuterium present, you may alter things like hydrogen bonding. And in fact, we have some work that shows that you can do in certain systems, but we were very happy here that the structure is unaltered by the presence of deuterium. And if you compare the small angle scattering data to the cryo EM data at high pH, you see long flexible cylinders. And if you measure these and you fit the data, you end up with a radius of about 4.2 nanometers, which is pretty much what we would expect. Now we also work with a fantastic group who do molecular dynamic simulations. And what they uh, did was modeled the high pH structure. And they found here that there's a flexible hollow cylinder and that this red ring here is the naphthalenes, the dark blue, is the external amino acid pointing out, and the dark blue here is the external amino acid pointing in. So what we have effectively is a bilayer structure. So two naphthalenes overlapping in this middle ring here with one amino acid group pointing outwards, then this kind of turquoisey group here is another amino acid, and then what you've got in here is the dark blue of the interior amino acids. So effectively, you've got two molecules overlapping with the naphthalene groups. So that's great. We understand a little bit about what these things should look like, but it's really important now to find out what the SANS data tells us and to look at what effect deuterating the system has on the type of SANS data that we get. And so what we've drawn here is a schematic of what that kind of onion-like packing might be inside um, the cylinder. So again, the red is the naphthalene, the dark blue is the, the amino acid right at the end, pointing in, the dark blue here is the amino acid right on the end pointing out, and then you've got the other amino acids either side of the naphthalene here. And so in the undeuterated system, what you can see is you get a hollow cylinder. So this SANS data is very indicative of a hollow cylinder, and it fits, again, to give you a very nice hollow cylinder. If you deuterate the naphthalene groups, you can see that there's not a huge amount of difference between the two small angle neutron scattering patterns. And this is sort of expected because when the neutrons are starting to look at this structure, the naphthalenes are buried on the inside. And so there's not a huge amount of difference uh, in the structure of something that has this presence and the structure of something that the neutrons effectively can't see. So we don't see a lot of change. If we move to here, you can see that this is now, this terminal amino acid uh, aromatic ring is removed. And what that means is, is that we're losing basically the kind of outside ring and the inside ring here. And you can see there are slight structural changes in here, but this will come out on the next slide a bit more clearly. In this particular scattering pattern, what we can see is we've deuterated this amino acid, which is represented by the light blue ring here. So again, we're removing something from the interior. But the real dramatic difference comes when we deuterate both this aromatic group and this aromatic group. Because what we're effectively doing is we're only now scattering from this part of the molecule. So we've lost pretty much all of this and all of this, and we're only left with a little bit of the red ring still to scatter from. And just for completeness, this is this structure, but run in H2O rather than D2O. So you can see that there are some subtle structural variations uh, between each of these scattering patterns. What becomes interesting is the parameters that we pull out when we fit these using SAS view. So we can fit two major parameters. One is the wall thickness. So that is basically the thickness of the wall. And then the core radius, which is just the radius of that interior hollow part. And you can see that for TUNAP FF undeuterated, the wall thickness is 2.2 nanometers. And the core radius is um, 1.8 nanometers. And if we add that up, to get an overall radius, we end up at about uh, four nanometers, which is pretty much commensurate with the X-ray scattering data, which is great because that tells us that our techniques are actually backing each other up. If we look at the naphthalene deuterated system here, so I said there wasn't a huge amount of difference between the two, uh, two scattering patterns. And indeed, when you fit the data, you find that the wall thickness is pretty much the same and the core radius is pretty much the same. It would be nice to be able to see a more layered structure, but the neutrons just don't have the resolution to pick that out. 
Now, when we go to this uh, group here, where we've taken off and we've effectively contrasted out this amino, uh, this aromatic group from this amino acid, we start to notice a difference. And what we find is if we get rid of this uh, part from the structure, we now see a wall thickness that is thinner because we've effectively lost the inner and outer ring from that diagram I showed you. And we see an increase in the core radius. So our wall thickness has gone down so, and our interior radius has gone up, which we would expect if the molecules were packing how the molecular dynamics simulations suggested they were. If we take the interior amino acid here, you see that we're not that different again from the undeuterated or the naphthalene deuterated. And again, this is suggestive that basically because it's on the inside, we don't really see anything happen. But the big difference occurs when we take this part deuterated and this part deuterated here. And you can see now the wall thickness is only 0.5 of a nanometer and the core radius is 2.5 nanometers. So a huge difference in structure, which basically means we're now no longer seeing effectively this whole part of the molecule. So that gave us a lot of confidence that we, we could back up the observations from the molecular dynamics simulations and we could actually see this in the neutron scattering. So the next thing we did was looked at what happened after a couple of hours when we'd added that gluconodelta-lactone molecule. So gelation should have occurred. You can invert the samples. They've definitely gelled. What you can see now from the SANS data is they all look actually reasonably similar. There's nothing, there's no obvious differences. I mean, there's, you know, they don't fit particularly well at high Q for some of them, uh, at low Q for some of them. And you can see here that the, the fitting on the, uh, this is the doubly deuterated. It, it's not brilliant, um, but, you know, there's definitely something, something going on here where you've got something comparable between all of these systems. So the next thing to do was to go to SASView and fit this data. And then we hit a problem because the data no longer fitted to this hollow uh, flexible cylinder model that we'd been using or the flexible cylinder model we've been using. And when it gets to a point like this, you know, we'd spent quite a few weeks fitting the data properly, suddenly came up with some new data and then it won't fit. There's two ways you can approach this. So you can put your data into SASView and just go through all of the drop-down menus and try every single model until you find one that fits, and you will eventually, um, but there is no guarantee, and in fact, it's very unlikely that any of those models that you randomly pick are going to be even remotely physically relevant. So what we decided to do was the much more sensible thing, which was to look at the literature. And what we wanted to know was, was there anything in the literature that could give us a guide as to where to start with the fitting? I don't like the idea of just putting the data into the fitting software and sort of ballparking where to start. I wanted an idea of what I was looking at. And I wanted to go back to what you would do if you didn't have something like SAS for you. So just by plotting the data in different ways, what could we learn about the system? So a very standard way of treating this data is to do a guinea plot. And in a standard guinea plot, you plot the natural log of the intensity versus Q squared. And in the very, very low Q regime, you can get radius of gyration information by fitting the linear gradient. So if you've got something that's got a, a circular cross section, so effectively you're looking at a sphere, you'll get a straight line at low Q, you can fit that, and it'll tell you what your radius of gyration is. So the first thing I did was did a guinea plot, and our data were not linear at low Q. So this tells me that what I'm looking at is not a sphere, which I'd kind of guessed, but it also probably doesn't have a sphere, a, a circular cross section. So in the literature, I came across this paper and a family of other related papers by Pierre Terek. And they were looking at uh, these orthodialkoxy arene organogelators. So they're gelling organic solvents, but the structures were really similar to what we were looking at. And what I found buried in this paper was this plot here, which we've been calling the modified Guinea plot where if you now plot the natural log of Q squared multiplied by the intensity versus Q squared, if your sample has an anisotropic cross section, so it's either elliptical or rectangular, you'll get a straight line at low Q. And this is shown very nicely in this paper. So this is their, their guinea plot with the log of IQ squared against Q squared. And they have this beautiful linear region. I plotted our data and lo and behold, we had a beautiful linear region that looked very, very similar to this. From this, you can use the relationship to calculate this T parameter and T is the thickness and the thickness here is the thickness of a fiber, which is basically twice the radius. Um, so you can use this in exactly the same way you would use a standard guinea plot, but on something that hasn't got a circular cross section. 
So we showed that uh, all of our data uh, followed this pattern. I was able to work out what the thickness should be and use that as a starting point to fit the data to a flexible elliptical cylinder model. And what we found was that the cylinders had a minor radius of about four nanometers, which is pretty much what the cylinder radius was to start off with, but an axis ratio of 2.5. So the major radius is 2.5 times bigger than the minor radius. So we found this for all of the samples, and we showed that they all fitted pretty well, with the exception of the doubly deuterated one, which fit fairly poorly and had a really big uh, axis ratio. The reason we think for this is, and we've got some data from cracky plots that sort of suggest this. Um, there's so little of the sample that's now scattering, the neutrons are unable to see it as a network and they're just seeing it as a thin disk. And so it stops looking basically like a three dimensional gel anymore as, as far as the neutrons can see. But we're doing some more work on this to try and understand it a bit better. So what this really shows quite nicely is that the cylinders we start off with in solution are not the cylinders that we end up with in the gel. So the next question to answer is, well, what happens? How do we get from a solution to a gel where clearly the two structures, not only are they different in three dimensions, but the actual structure of the cylinder itself is different. And for that, we turn to time resolve data. So what we did was every 10 minutes, took a neutron scattering pattern. And so you start off with this hollow core cylinder. So pre-gelation, you have this bump at high Q, which is indicative of the hollow core. And the first thing that happens after tens of minutes is the hollow core disappears. The second thing that happens is the sample starts to look more elliptical. So you start, you go from something that's very obvious, a cylinder, and then it becomes an elliptical cylinder over time. And then you get this kind of flattening out and widening, which is a basically like a lateral aggregation. We try to think why this might have happened. And we came down to the fact that the interior of the cylinder and the exterior of the cylinder have actually got different pKa's. So they respond at different pHs. And so we have a two-step process here where we lose this sort of uh, center hollow here and it becomes solid. And then this effectively flattens out to become elliptical. And then there's, um, as we lose, as, as the exterior is affected by the drop in pH, these fibers now start to come together. So this has given us a huge amount more information on how these materials actually go from a solution to a gel. It's really important with 2NAPFF to understand this because this is actually one of the kind of, you know, the, the real model systems and it's a great one to work with because it's really reproducible. But understanding the solution state structure and how it gets to the gel state structure starts to open the door to how you design new materials. So for the last sort of few minutes or so of the talk, I want to show you one example of how we've designed a new material based exact on exactly the same molecular starting block, but with a very subtle change. So we can do things that involve changing the chirality of the molecule to access new structures. Now, it's a really, really subtle change here. We've got two chiral centers. I'll show you this in more detail on the next slide. So we've got these two chiral centers in 2NAPFF. So the 2NAPFF I've talked about um, in all of the previous work is, is the LL. Um, but we can also have the DD, the LD, and the DL. More of that in a moment. Our system that we understand really, really well, this 2NAPFF, is great. But if we want to make a gel that isn't necessarily <coughs> made of flexible fibers, maybe we want a gel that's a bit tougher, or gel with a different functionality. How are we going to go about designing that material? So we could just make a new molecule from scratch. You know, we could decide what we wanted to make, make it, and then see if it gels. It's incredibly laborious to do this. These, these molecules, you know, need decent organic, very good organic synthetic chemists to be able to make them. And there's also no guarantee that any molecule you make is going to self-assemble to give you a gel. So this is not a particularly efficient way of, of doing this. So what we could do is take the TNAPFF that we know so much about and make really small changes to it, which is a lot easier to do. And it tells us more about what is possible by changing a single molecule. We could also, and this is something that we've done recently, change the solvent. So self-assembly is very dependent on the solvent environment. Um, and this allows us to access a large array of new materials quickly. I've got some great data on this where we've changed counter ions in solution, which has a massive effect, but I'm not going to have time to talk about it today. So our 2NAPFF has got its two chiral centers, one here and one here. And so we can have 
two L centers on one molecule, two D centers on one molecule, an L and a D on one molecule, and a D and an L. So that gives us four molecules to start with, all of which are based around our original 2NAP FF. We can also start with a racemic mixture, which has no preferred chirality, or we could take LL and DD in solution, and we could just mix them 50-50 and see what happens. And the question we wanted to answer is, does changing the chirality actually matter? Will that one subtle flip of part of the molecule make any difference to the structure we get? So we went through a similar process where we looked in solution. Um, and the first thing we did was looked at the solution uh, neutron scattering data. And it was really clear that the samples were really, really different. So the first thing to, to note is that the, the DD and the LL are identical. So I'm just going to show the DD data. And what we get is a 3.6 nanometer hollow cylinder with 1.9 nanometer thick walls, pretty much the same as we've seen before. If we, however, take the mixture of 50-50 LL and DD, what we end up with now is a 5.3 nanometer hollow cylinder with 2.2 nanometer thick walls. So DD on its own and LL on their own both look the same, but mix them together and you get something different. So that's interesting. They're not self-sorting. They're not forming basically all LL and all DD. They're not separating themselves out. What they're doing is they're mixing together and they're forming something that's different than what we started with. So that's interesting because it's telling us a bit about the packing. The packing has to be, the uh, cylinder has to be larger to accommodate the two different chiralities. But what was really cool is when you put the L and the D on the same molecule, and indeed the DL looks exactly the same. And what you get now is A, absolutely gorgeous neutron data, and B, you get um, incredibly uh, monodispersed, very, very stiff hollow tubes. So these are 13.4 nanometers in diameter, and they have 1.3 nanometer thick walls. So they're very open tubes with very, very thin walls. So, which is fascinating because now all we've done is we've just moved one part of the molecule and we've suddenly gone from this to this. And then finally, when you look at the racemic mixture where you've got lots of possible chiralities present, you can't actually fit the data because what you have is loads of coexisting species. You can see some of these, you can see some of these, you can see some of these. And so what we have here now is some sort of sorting. Um, which is really interesting that that subtle change has made such a difference. So these are all in solution at high pH. So after gelation, we still saw some differences, but most of the samples still showed the characteristic flexible elliptical cylinder fit. I'm just going to focus on the LL, the mixture, and the LD. So the LL does exactly what we would want it to do. It goes from a hollow cylinder to a flexible elliptical cylinder with exactly the right kind of size parameters. The mixture goes from that hollow cylinder um, that I showed you, but with slightly different size parameters, to a flexible elliptical cylinder with commensurate size parameters. So it's undergoing the same process. It's doing that collapse and then kind of widening out. But interestingly, the gel state structure of the LD and the solution state structure of the LD are identical. And so what's happening here is the gel isn't forming by a change in the cylinder structure. It's forming simply by the, the, the cylinders coming together and forming this three-dimensional network. And if you want to look at the rheological properties, the rheological properties of these long, stiff nanotubes are completely different to the rheological properties of either the LL or indeed the mixture. So here what we've shown is a tiny, tiny change in a material uh, can actually produce a, a completely new outcome. And that's really exciting because that suggests to us we don't have to keep going and redesigning molecules. By changing very small parts of the ones we know something about and by doing some decent scattering on them, we can actually really start to understand them more. So since then, we've gone on, we've looked at, as I said, changing the solvent. So we've changed the counter ions in solution, and that's had a huge effect. We've also shown that um, swapping out the uh, solvent from H2O to D2O for some small molecular weight gelators has a massive effect on their structure and that what you measure in deuterium isn't always the same as what you measure in hydrogen. So I'm going to draw it to a close here. I've got about a minute left and I want to talk about conclusions and the future of where we're going with this. So I would hope that I've maybe managed to convince you that actually for looking at gels, Saxon stands are brilliant tools. I think they need to be used with microscopy. I think it's always important to have microscopy if you can get it. And obviously, rheological data is really important. But the Saxon sands are going to tell you things that other techniques can't. And they may be a bit more um, complicated to actually do, them, to, to do the analysis. But to be honest, if you try hard enough to fit the data and you're careful with it, you can get some great answers out.
They also allowed us to probe dynamics in a way that we've not been able to do before. So being able to look at that transition from a solution to a gel. Um, they allow us to investigate how a small change can lead to a brand new material, which allows us to then start to think about design rules and what are the design rules for making different gels. What we're currently doing at the moment is we've been doing some wide angle scattering data and looking at two dimensional oriented data to look at packing in TUNAP FF at different concentrations. We use very, very dilute systems here, um, way under the dilute limit. Um, so you don't see anything really, you don't see any backbone packing, you don't see any crystallinity. As soon as you increase the concentration, you get wax, uh, wax peaks coming out really strongly. You start to see scattering from the naphthalene naphthalene distance, and you start to see the packing of these onto a 2D, bleak, uh, 2D oblique crystalline lattice, which is really exciting and tells us some interesting things about how the backbones are packing, but we are still working on a detailed analysis of this, and we've got a great idea for a neutron experiment to look at this. And we're also, as a kind of fun aside, looking at uh, working with our chemistry colleagues to look at doing molecular dynamic simulations in a virtual reality environment where we actually get to walk into a nanotube and uh, look at what happens uh, as it self-assembles, which is kind of silly, but also really good fun and might prove to be really useful in the future. So I'm going to stop there and um, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be really happy to take your questions.